Okay, we're, we are rolling into Revelation chapter 4. I'm having to re-record this because something funny happened with the, uh, the older notebook computer I was on to record. came up with a strange echo that I could not resolve in post. So we're going to try this again and uh, jump right into Revelation chapter 4. It's my hope that uh, by going in a chronological order um, as Revelation is laid out, that uh, by going in this proper order, that Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse makes more sense because as we know from the scriptures, from chapter 1, um, John was instructed to write that which was, which we could say that which was, was the Gospel of John, for instance, and all the things in, that happened in uh, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, the things that are, and that will be chapters 2 and 3, which is the church age, and then we go into chapter 4. Chapter 4, we're introduced to the throne room of God, and we have no more church mentioned at all in uh, the remaining chapters that cover the tribulation periods. So that's all through uh, chapter 19. Uh, now we find ourselves um, in a place where John finds himself in the throne room of God, and he's speaking of things that are meta tauta after these things that um, don't fit in the order any other way because these are things that have not happened yet. And as we get moving in the rest of the chapters, I wanted to um, be clear that those things that we are reading about in the rest of the book of Revelation, it's impossible that those things could have happened. So I want you to keep an eye out for that. Don't just take my word for it. Okay? Keep an eye out for that. And um, so let's go ahead and roll right into um, Revelation chapter 4 at this time. So what we read in Revelation chapter 1 to recap is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly tacos take place, which uh, must take place tacos, not tacos, Tacos like uh, a tachometer. A tachometer will register the revving, the speed of an engine. And so these things will take place rapid, rapidly in quick succession when they begin to happen. Okay, And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. This is the only book of the Bible that has such a promise for the believer. So we do well to heed what, it, what the uh, word says about those blessings. Christ, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. When I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment, down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if we find in a furnace. And his voice was as the voice or as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, his face, was like the sun shining in its strength. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen. This is the outline for the book in verse 19. And the things which are and the things which will take place after this, Magitata. So after those things which are. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So here's the outline of the church. There's this strange kind of a thing that happened to uh, John while he's at, at Patmos and sees some strange stuff that no one's ever seen in quite the same way in this vision. But then when we get into chapters 4 and 5, he sees some things that are, are familiar. And we will take a look at those, but they're familiar to Ezekiel, they're familiar to Isaiah. Uh, even to Daniel. So we're going to take a close look at those. Now, if you'll note on the bottom of this slide, Hebrews 4.15, and there's a reason why that's here, because this chapter introduces us to what we call as the throne of God. And I want, I want it to be understood that it's not a throne as in a regular type of a, a chair or seating that we would normally think of. Um, and in my humble opinion. Uh, let's start with uh, Hebrews 4, starting with, uh, let's say, verse 14. Seeing then, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it is the opinion of, of many that the throne or the, the seat of God in heaven is uh, would be this mercy seat. This is where in the Holy of Holies, Blood was sprinkled, and um, that is, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. So often, though, about this passage, or rather in the Word of God, often when prophets saw visions in the Old Testament, they were asleep, or they went into a trance-like state, that type of thing, and they would see visions or dreams unfold before them. Most of the time, they simply wrote as the Holy Spirit superintended, or having seen nothing but write, writing down what what uh, they're, they're instructed to write down without having seen anything. John here is is a little different than some. Um, let's let's look for instance in, in chapter one. Tell me if this sounds like just a vision or a dream to you, uh, and opinions will vary. I'll state that. Uh, notice though that in chapter one. Of Revelation verse 10 John hears a voice behind him and then look down at verse 12 uh, John turns to see so he's turning and Jesus does present himself um, with a particular appearance okay and then uh, look at verse 17 John hasn't been in a trance or dreamlike state because he falls down John actually falls down Jesus physically puts his hand on him, on his shoulder, and then he gives him a writing assignment. So, now flip ahead, um, chapter 4, four one, we read that, that John looked. So, he looked in a certain direction. So, verse 2, John immediately finds himself before the throne of heaven. Um, just like chapter 5, verse 1, John saw. So in chapter 4, verse 4, John wept much, so he's crying. That can happen, but 
um, if we were in a dream state, I don't know about you, but we're not necessarily aware that we're crying and sobbing much. And that's what the intent is here of the passage that we're supposed to get. John is just sobbing. Verse 5, look, uh, an unidentified elder comes to speak to him. Uh, verse, verse 6, again, John looks again. Once again, he has control of motor reflexes and movement because he, he turns and he looks. Verse 11, John looks around again. He sees and he hears. So um, I looked is used 70 times in Revelation. I saw is used 35 times. Uh, I, I beheld seven times. I heard is used 23 times. And when he ex experiences this, it is audibly loud, you know, like a trumpet or like many waters. So it's loud. We don't usually, typically, when we're dreaming or seeing a vision or something like that, we don't necessarily register that enough to record that, that wow, that was, that was loud. So notice that. that I think that's interesting. It's not unlike uh, Saul uh, before we knew him as Paul on the road to Damascus. He heard a great sound like a trumpet, you know, and he was knocked down to the ground. Um, so though with his limited first century temporal world experience um, in a three-dimensional world, he has trouble describing his other worldly experience and um, uh, well, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that usually um, you don't think in terms of what upper dimensions would be like, if I can put it that way. Um, if you imagine a, a, a flat world like this piece of paper is a flat world, okay? If I put my finger on top of this flat world, all of a sudden the flat people who can only see this way, on this plane, are going to see all of a sudden this pancake shape, very flat, flatter than a pancake. They're going to notice a line that's going to block right in front of them. Now, if I if I pass, were to pass my hand through the paper, my finger, and as it changes, see, in, from their perspective, all of a sudden it, it goes from narrow to wider and it starts changing shape and morphing and doing all these weird things that they're going to be freaking out about. Okay, now as I do this on top of it, because we live in a three-dimensional world, as I do this on top of their flat world, from your perspective and mine, we can see my whole hand going down on top of their flat world, so we can see all the way around it. They can't, they just see the edge, like a wall. Now, similarly to us, and this is what I'm told, this is what I understand from physics, uh, and needless to say, I haven't experienced this, but as I understand what happens um, in the third dimension is that just as we um, are limited by walls in our space, you might be in a room right now, um, and you're, it's doubtful that your room has all glass walls, you're limited to what you can see in this box. But in whatever other dimensions are up there, probably all the other dimensions that are up there, and physicists have estimated there are at least 10 dimensions, they would be able to see right down into our room, uh, possibly even into us. I don't know. Um, like we're transparent, um, almost like x-rays. In a, in a flat world, uh, if you were to lay a rubber band on this page, they would just see a big wall encircle them. They would think that they're trapped. We can see down into the rubber band, and we're just fine. We can see it, that they're fine. Um, so just like we, from an upper dimension, in our third dimension, can look down and see what's going on, um, God and, and whoever lives in, 
and upper dimensions can see into our world in ways that we can't. So imagine a two-dimensional person living in a flat world trying to describe things he's saying in our dimension. If he was taken out and we had them in this flat world and we're trying to tilt him at different angles to see things and experience colors and things that he's never seen before, he's going to have you know, one heck of a time trying to describe what's going on around him. He's going to struggle with that. Well, I think this is a lot of what we see when the prophets and here John is trying to describe something in um, a realm that is just beyond his comprehension. Um, I believe that God is um, superseding a lot of different events for John as he's here before the throne because uh, as, as the quirky photo indicates here, this artist rendition, um, the white glare like the Shekinah glory of God, the very presence of God illustrated in this bright white flash um, rather crudely. Um, we know that that would normally, uh, to a, a mortal, not in their glorified bodies, you'd be consumed and, and turned to powder, turned to ash. This is why when Moses wanted to experience God and see his presence, he had to be hidden with his face back into the cleft of a rock as the Lord passed by. And that was likely pre-incarnate Christ. God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity before he was Jesus, uh, walking by. And he held his hand out and shielded Moses as he passed by so that he wouldn't be incinerated. And the after effects for Moses is that he glowed for a few days and he had to actually put a veil over his face, right? So I think something supernatural is happening here uh, for John's sake, because uh, normally there's there's no way in the world he'd be able to survive that kind of an encounter. Um, and even if you say that it was just a vision, it's just a vision or a dream, it wasn't real, same thing though. If he's going to show, them, show John what's going on and give him a vision of what's going on, he would have to still filter what John is seeing. So either way, um, I think that's the case. So let's take a look at this now. And this is the reason why I say again that we decided to go into um, the Olivet Discourse. Because we've got the churches. We have the Laodicean Church was the last um, church that John recorded in Revelation chapter 3. So then we get into chapter 4. After this, and there's that phrase again, metatata, from uh, Revelation 119. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So, uh, after this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Not, not a literal wooden door with hinges and a brass doorknob or something so crude as that, but he recognized that there was some type of a, uh, you know, some type of a portal that looked different and that opened up into heaven, and who knows, but that the glory of God might have been shining forth out of this. It probably was, but he looked and he, he saw this, and he recognized it as a, a portal coming out of heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, again, to convey loud, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this, meditata. So here he is, and John's getting a, a, a look at um, what's going on in, in heaven, that there's a portal there, and he gets taken up supernaturally, because um, he, he didn't say come up here, and John was able to fly up there, so somehow John got up there. So the Lord had to have stepped in and made this happen. So some will insist that this is rapture. I think without it actually saying overtly that it's rapture, that going into the rest of the chapter, we've got to see chronologically that that is at least implied. Why is that implied, Dave? Well, it's implied because um, what we've got going on is 
a description of the throne room of heaven, which we're not there yet, right? And then after the throne room of heaven, we have God opening the seals, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, opening the seals of judgment upon an unbelieving world. And these events that take place are, as we've covered before and we'll cover at length in Revelation, there are our future. So this is chronological order. So this is where the rapture would happen, although the text does not say in Revelation 4.1 that this is the rapture. This is where it would happen. It would have to be. Okay, and I think we can demonstrate after church and before the tribulation is in our future that there is a, a rapture. We've already studied that there's a rapture. So this is where it's got to be. And I think we can further demonstrate as we get out to the book of Revelation that those events, again, as we've uh, stressed before and as we looked at in the Olivet Discourse, they're future, future events. They have not taken place yet. And they could not have taken place yet. So prove me, test me as we go in to Revelation and and um, verify that what I say is, is true. So the rapture, again, uh, is from the Latin. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible. I like to emphasize that a lot. Rapimur, um, it's the proper tense of rapio. Um, it's, it's also where we get the word rapt. You know, I, I, I was in rapt attention or the word rapture. It's all derived from the past participle, uh, rapio. So we saw in First Thessalonians 4.13 um, through 17, we saw the word harpazo in there and how it's used. We're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Second coming is Jesus comes down to the earth and sets his foot on the earth, and we come back with him. We saw... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.50 will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And also in the context of, of John 14.2 and 3, that Jesus says, I'm, I'm going, and if I'm going, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you to be with me where I am. He's not saying I'm going to come back down and be here with you, which he will do, but it's different language he uses in John 14, verses 2 and 3. He says, I'm going to take you up to where uh, you'll be with me, and where I'm going, uh, you're going to be. And so we'll be with together forever. Um, what are some other some passages? There are some other passages that um, I would like to look at in addition to this that I think are are um, are key. They're a blessing, and uh, I, I trust that you're blessed by what you read as well. Three passages. The first one I would like to bring your attention to, and you can make your own decision on this. Um, just because I read it and, I, and I'm not the first one here, uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's gospel, but you tell me what it sounds like to you. So turn to Isaiah and turn to chapter 26. Isaiah 26. Let's start with verse 19, actually. 19 to 21. Tell me what this sounds like to you. Your dead shall live, together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Verse 20, come my people, into your chambers. When does that happen before? You're going to rise from the dead, right? Together with my dead body, they shall arise, all right? Come, my people, into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. I think of ten virgins at that point and five of them being left outside. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Does that not sound like the time of Jacob's trouble? For behold... The Lord comes out of his place, for what reason? To punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. Interesting, isn't it? Just something for you to put a, make a note about and mark down and research further on your own. And you, you tell me. Uh, another passage that I would like to look at is in Zephaniah. 
Okay, Zephaniah, almost all the way to the end of your Old Testament, chapter 2. Make a note and read it later. Zephaniah chapter 2. Uh, we can, the key verse we want to look at is verse 3, but we can start in verse 1. Gather yourself together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Now, from the language we've looked at in previous couple of weeks, the day of the Lord is when? The day of the Lord is that day, that final generation, the day of his indignation, the time of his wrath, the Lord's day, the tribulation. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. How would you be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger? That's like uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, about trouble that falls upon all the earth, everyone on the earth. That time of tribulation, a time of trouble that is going to affect the whole world. There's no escape from it. Who escaped from the flood outside of Noah's family? Did anyone? Who escaped from the fire coming down on Sodom and Gomorrah other than Lot? And his family, did anybody survive that? Hide in a basement somewhere and live? So the answer to that, obviously, is no. One more real quick. Um, take a look at Psalm 27. Right about in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 27. I think these are kind of cool. They're worth studying, worth considering, worth praying about. And, don't, and again, don't take my word for it. You'll always want to be the Berean and, and research the word that I or anybody else passes on to you. Um, Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Does God have a pavilion here on earth that I don't know about? All right, so let's go there. He shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. Well, if he's got a pavilion here on earth, it's a really good secret, right? So it must be something that he's disclosed or revealed or picks you up and hides you there. Because you're not going to just walk to it if it's a secret. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So just some verses to consider. Um, that I would say, you know, for the uh, for the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, um, We've had our time from the first century when the church was established, Acts chapter 2, all the way up to the point of the rapture. The prophetic time clock stopped for Israel at that time in the first century. And it, uh, all the prophecies pick up in earnest in, in complete fulfillment beginning after the rapture and were removed out of the way, Romans chapter 11. Israel is once again grafted back in. So we've left a place for Israel to be grafted in. They will again be grafted in. So second coming will be predominantly um, for Israel. It's about Israel more than anything. Yes, there will be tribulation saints from all the nations, but it's mostly, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's mostly about Israel. There are going to be some collateral benefits for survivors in the nation. So that dynamic we see as far back as, as um, Job. Um, Job 19, verses 25 to 27, write that one down. That's another one to look at. But that's the same type of a, a thing we see here. Um, let's move forward then. Now that I've given you um, plenty to think about. Um, there we go. Verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. So that part, uh, I was, etc. Um, in the Greek, it's I became in the Spirit. The I was isn't really accurate. 
um, you, you'll see the same type of wording. I became in the spirit, Revelation 1, 10. We, we just read that. Uh, I was completely wrapped in um, vision into the heavenly world is kind of what he's trying to say. So notice a throne set in heaven. It was set. It wasn't placed in heaven. So it's there in heaven that he's at. It was, it was set in heaven. It's situated there. Or literally, it lay in heaven. So it's set down. It's, it's laying in heaven. So the throne, the throne is mentioned 11 times, referring to God's throne, plus two other throne references in the chapter. Uh, it likely, in this case, is not a literal chair, but could be more like the mercy seat, as we discussed, as um, is the Ark of the Covenant, where blood is sprinkled in the Holy of Holies. So, so the question I ask you to think about now in the next few minutes or over the next week is, who is the one seated upon the throne? Is it the Father or the Son? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Or really, is it is it all three? So remember, Jesus was ascended, and he sat on his throne on the right hand of the Father in heaven. We also know that Messiah will sit on his Father's throne. That's a couple references there. One is uh, Psalm Psalm 119, or no, Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. And also Revelation 3.21, we see that the throne is in heaven. Um, verse 3, he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. Now notice he's not describing the throne there, which I think is fascinating. He's describing... He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now, it's not a rainbow in the way we traditionally like to think of a rainbow, you know, where one end goes in one direction and ends in the ground, and the other end goes in the other direction and ends in the ground, and it's got all the colors of a prism in there. This one's a little bit different, a little different. But the word rainbow should have been more accurately translated just a bow as in it's a complete circle so it was a circle around around the throne a real rainbow is if if you were in an airplane and you were flying over what we see on the ground as a rainbow you'd be seeing a circle you'd be seeing it from a different perspective so in uh, chapter 21 verse 11 john describes the jasper as crystal clear like a diamond which would refract light all around, like a prism. Light would catch it, it would catch the light, and it would shine it around all over the place. So here it's capturing the glory of God and, and shining it around. This is what John sees. The uh, What he calls a, a sardius stone was ruby red, and it's named after the city where the stones were found. Um, we had a we also have in here uh, an emerald, and an emerald, of course, is greenish. It's going to be more green-like. We had a, um, a description like this in um, Ezekiel chapter 1, and we'll look at that at greater length because we have to go to Ezekiel chapter 1 because there's so many other similarities in these, these visions that, uh, that we're looking at here that are being described. Um, but not just yet, but you can look ahead if you want, because we will not get to it this week, but we will next time. Um, it says, on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it, it says in Ezekiel. Uh, also, from the appearance of his waist upward, I saw, as it were. So he's, Ezekiel's having trouble describing what he's looking at, so he's saying as it were a lot, because he's saying it kind of looks like this and it kind of looks like that. It might be some of that dimensionality stuff that I was describing, um, because this is something that happens outside or beyond the third dimension. So Ezekiel's having trouble kind of trying to describe, it looked a little like this, but it wasn't quite that, it looked like this. So he's seeing things that are, you know, making having difficulty making a cognitive connection with what our world is as he's trying to describe it. So um, so he says, as it were a lot, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around it and 
from the appearance of his waist in downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So here, uh, Ezekiel knew what he was describing. He was trying to describe the best he could, the Shekinah glory of God, right? And that, you know, would, would be a, a difficult kind of a thing to try to relay to people because we don't have any such experience. Um, this is interesting that I wanted to point out. As you see there um, on your left, the priest wore a, a plate, a, a breastplate, and this was called an ephod, and it had 12 stones on it, each one representing um, the 12 tribes of Israel. So notice, remember um, that in the east and everything east of Jerusalem, they read right to left, not left to right the way we do. So um, what we see as the very first stone is the Sardius stone, and it's the stone of Reuben. Reuben was the first son. Um, his name translates as behold a son. And then we have the other stones, and look at the last stone. The last stone is the Jasper, and it's Benjamin's stone. Son of my right hand is the meaning of the name Benjamin. So behold a son and son of my right hand. Also, the other thing we, we see here is besides this, you know, the colors that are similar to what's shining around the rainbow, is that these stones that were selected that represent these colors are the first stone and the last stone. So you know, it was talking about the first and the last. I think so around the throne were 24 other stones thrones are not really thrones but uh, seats is probably more accurate 24 seats and on these seats I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads um, much debate on who this is let's look at who it can possibly be first let's probably eliminate a little bit also of who it could not be um, not angels it could not be angels, although this, this is a, a popular opinion. If you would, I've been in Ezekiel. Let me flip all the way back to Revelation, and you go there with me as well, please. Go to Revelation, and we can demonstrate, I think, with context and some simple logic, how that this cannot be angels. Look at, uh, we're going to look at 711. No, not the store. Okay, in verse 11, chapter 7, verse 11. All the angels stood around the throne. How many of the angels? Correct. All the angels stood around the throne. And the elders. And the four living creatures. And fell on their faces before the Lord. Before the throne and worshiped God. So we have different groups here we have the angels in one group and the elders around them okay so that's entirely separate now the other question comes is um, Israel whether or not it can be Israel well this is the time of Jacob's trouble and as we see in Romans chapter 11 this is the time when they're grafted back in particularly during the great tribulation and that really picks up in earnest three and a half years after this event here, three and a half years later, because it's a seven-year week of years. It's a seven-year tribulation. The great tribulation starts in the middle. But although this entire period is the time of Jacob's trouble, but really the great tribulation and the time when, when massive conversion for Israel really begins to happen uh, at the second half um, I believe is what way we understand that. So Israel is not yet saved, crowned, and glorified until the end. Their great redemption period officially begins at this time, but more in the middle, and it continues from there. Uh, take a look at Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. That records when Michael stands up. And when does Michael stand up? 
Well, we see that in Revelation chapter 12. Michael stands up. Um, Satan is kicked down to the earth, no more given access to the throne to accuse the saints or anybody else. His wings are clipped, as it were, uh, and uh, because Michael has had it. Uh, and so at the command of the Lord, he's allowed to kick Satan to the curb. In his anger, Satan does a lot of things that we'll take a look at. So, so at least by chapter 12, we see Michael fight the dragon, Satan, probably the only angel powerful enough to cast him down for good, uh, would be Michael, with no more access to accuse the saints before the throne of God. Um, also, the 24 elders do not represent the tribulation saints who are at this point not yet saved, right? Tribulation hasn't even started yet. So how can you have tribulation saints before the Lord if the tribulation has not officially begun? It does not begin until the Lamb of God breaks that first seal on the scroll, okay? Uh, how much time passes between the rapture of the saints and before that happens where the Lamb breaks the scroll, the seal of the scroll? I do not know. Time there does not work the same as time here. In fact, it's timeless up there, relatively speaking. So um, I think John is only going to recognize passage of time in the sense of events that happen. Um, other than that, he's not going to be cognizant of time as he's known it. So the tribulation begins in chapter 6. Uh, we see the tribulation saints in chapter 7 again verse 7 to uh, 7 verses 13 to 14 take a quick look uh, then one of the elders answered saying to me so here's an elder and he's saying to John who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from and I said sir you know in other words that's John's way it's an old colloquialism of saying you tell me sir you know so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So there he shows um, John some of the saints that are there before the throne, and they are the tribulation saints. At least the first fruits of the tribulations. It's not all of them because they keep going, and there are going to be more martyrs as time goes on all the way up through chapter 19, right? So the elder was asking John about this different group. So tribulation saints are a different group. And the way Israel is presented is completely separate. So uh, as we are contextually metatauta after the churches and where the rapture would have happened, this is likely the church, the 24 elders. Note the, the crowns of gold. These wouldn't be the royalty type crowns with the spiky points on top of the heads as... Uh, Folks often point out, you know, the type of crown with the, the gold points on top, often think of like a for a prince um, or a princess or something. It's not that. These are the victor's crown. This is These are the types of crowns they wear in the Olympics where it's a, a gold leaf and you have it in the bottom of the picture here in the, in the white, as we see. That's what we're used to seeing in during the time of John from the Olympics. And they would stand... On the Bema, is that familiar? Like the Bema, the Bema judgments are, it's a judgment of a war. Here you get the gold, here you get the silver, here you get the, the bronze, whatever. Now there's only three victors though at a time in that, in those Bema's, Bema judgments um, in the Olympics. But for us, this is a Bema seat of judgment that we're going to find out about from, um, as we've read in, in Matthew 25 that we will look more closely at in the future. But those are times when we're crowned with these victor's crowns, as you see here, where it's kind of like the laurel. Only uh, In this case, they're made of gold and not uh, green leaves. So um, now the 24 elders represent the church. Very likely uh, they could be, I mean, they could be representatives who we don't know. I believe there's... I, you know, it says that there's 24 elders, people who want to take a, a more of a figurative type type of look at this might say, well, they're just these were just a vision popped into John's head to to simulate 
or to represent the church, but they're nondescript. They're not really, they're not really going to be actual physical elders. They're just, those are just representatives of the church in some figurative way. Well, one of those figuratives came over and talked to John a couple times. So I, I take them as being literal elders, who they are, uh, how they were selected. I, I don't know. Again, we don't want to impose on scripture what isn't written there. They could be the 12 apostles, um, and Paul as picked personally by Christ to replace Judas um, in uh, the book of Acts chapter 9. Um, you, know, you could take a look at, at Matthew 19.28 and uh, 1 Corinthians 6.3 regarding that. But the other 12, then who would be the other 12? Well, we don't know. You know, it doesn't say. Uh, perhaps uh, of the 12 missionaries traveling, you know, because they went off in two by two, the travel traveling companions with the apostles, you know, you had the, uh, Epaphras was in here. He was one of the church founders at least, but you had Luke, you had Barnabas, Philemon, uh, even Titus and Timothy and others. So you, you, but you have more than 12 of those. So who they are and how they're selected, we don't know. We'll find out. Okay, um, it doesn't say, so I'm not going to speculate beyond that. I'm just laying out some possibilities here. Uh, we've heard it often in um, sermons, probably at some time in the past, saying, well, these are, you know, the 12 apostles. And what's another 12 I know of in the Bible? Because that's where we tend to look at numbers. Oh, I know. Maybe they are the, the 12 patriarchs of the different tribes of Israel. So, you know, maybe it's that. Well, no, Israel is Israel, and the church is the church, and they're different. And we'll see how they're different here in just a minute. And um, there is interesting, because 24, the only other place, um, I think, in the Bible where you have 24 is, is in First Chronicles. I think it's First Chronicles 24, ironically, where David organizes the uh, 24 courses of the Levitical priests. Um, and there's... The number, as I understand, were closer to 24,000 of them, I think. But there are 24 representatives of those courses of uh, Levites, and they all served for about a week, and they changed that Shabbat. Um, maybe there's a, a couple-year rotation where they did it. You'd have to reread the, the chapter and, and, and find out uh, exactly how often that did it. But uh, that's another place in the Bible where there's uh, 24 like that. Um, we often put and interpolate more into, uh, impose more of our understanding of numbers in um, the Bible than what is expressly written, and we want to be careful about doing that too often. Um, so it could be, it, you know, I don't know, they, uh, it could be something like that where we have representatives of the church in that type of a way. Um, let's take another look at this, though. So here's another way of looking at these 24 elders. And then um, you know, we're get, coming in close to where we're going to finish up for the night. But look at the 24 elders versus the tribulation sins. In um, uh, chapter 4, the 24 elders have crowns. And in, in chapter 7, where it's talking about the tribulation saints, notice that they have no crowns mentioned. Uh, the 24 elders have harps, and in um, the tribulation saints, they have palms. It describes palms. Now, about the 24 elders, what's the robes of white? You know, it's purity, right? They're all dressed in white, and they're also kept out of the tribulation, Revelation 3.10, concerning the church. Um and in Revelation 7, they are saved out of the tribulation, not kept from it. They are saved out of the tribulation. So notice these are different. So for those folks who like to say, no, the church is going into the tribulation, well, you've got a problem here because we've got these couple different groups. Notice the difference here, Revelation 4 and Revelation 7. How do we go into the tribulation? And some are kept out of the tribulation in Revelation 3.10, but here and in Revelation chapter 7, they are saved out of the tribulation. Uh, in Revelation 4, those who represent the church, they sit on thrones. And again, there are these chairs are uh, described in these verses, Revelation 
1, 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, 3, and, and take a note also at 1 Peter 2, 9. And the tribulation saints are standing before the thrones. They're not sitting. They're standing before, uh, actually before the throne. Uh, we, the church, reign as kings and priests. Revelation 1, 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, 1 Peter 2, 9. Again, that description is there. The tribulation saints are described as, as they serve him day and night. But really, and this is key, and then we'll we'll probably wrap it up here very quickly for uh, for reasons of time right around here. Look at the song that is sung in in Revelation chapter five, the song of the redeemed. Uh, now we're we just jumped ahead to Revelation chapter five. We're not in there yet, but this is the song that it's a look ahead at the twenty four elders. Okay, look starting verse eight. Um, now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue, and people and nation verse 10 and have made us kings and priests to our god and we shall reign on the earth amen i'm not sure what the melody is of that song and how that translates from one language to the other and how we're going to sing that in heaven but uh, i've got a feeling that the holy spirit will supernaturally help us remember those lyrics because i i can't hardly remember lyrics like i used to at all uh, but if you're into that and you want to memorize these lyrics, you can go ahead and do that, but it'll probably sound different, and it'll probably even be a different language by the time we get up there. But look at what it's expressing. What an awesome thing. Only Jesus, the Lamb of God, is worthy to take the scroll. This is what worship is about. This is the song of the redeemed. Notice that the elders and the angels before the throne are praising God. They're not there in ripped jeans and standing up with their arms in the air and, and singing about, oh, how, how he loves me and look how awesome he is toward me. And, and God makes me feel so good about myself. And no, it's all about him. It's all falling on their faces before him. Even the victor's crown that the Lord gives us, we turn around and we give right back because he is the one who's worthy, not us. What a blessed thing. And open the seals, for you were slain. You were slain. You did this, Lord, not me. I didn't save myself. I didn't, uh, you know, ask Jesus into my heart, not before the Holy Spirit opened my heart to receive, because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. You're worthy. You did all the work, Lord. The Father gave his Son. The Son willingly laid down his life, and the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. So salvation is all of God. It's not any of our works, lest any man should boast. I didn't come to this on my own. There's no way I could have. I was dead in trespasses and sins. And no man seeks after God, it says in Romans 3. We don't seek after God until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, quickens us, and helps us to see, because he's convicting us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, it says in Matthew, until we see and we realize our state that we're in. And then we, we realize that we're separated from God. We're enemies of God. We're as far as the east is from the west until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, quickens us to receive that which is a holy gift that is all of God. Our faith is a gift. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So somewhere along the line, you've got to hear the word of God and respond to it. So he says, you were slain and you have redeemed us. You've um, Paid the price, the penalty on the cross, you redeemed us, you bought us back to God by your own blood. See, we couldn't do that. You know, we can't go to the store and buy some of the blood of Christ and have that. Re he did it for us. He shed his blood for us out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. See, that's the church, not Israel. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, which can include Jews, of course, and has, and have made us, kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign 
on the earth. Amen. And that's what true worship looks like. It's not singing about ourselves or singing to ourselves or any other such thing. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Notice that this seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. It could be just a coincidence, although I don't really believe in coincidences, but remember where the seven lamps were in chapter one? John was on the Isle of Patmos during the church age, early in the church age, and Jesus was walking among the seven lamps there, and he was ministering to the seven lamps there on the earth. Now John is before the throne of God, and where are the seven lamps? The seven lamps of fire are burning before the throne. So if there's a representation that isn't actual church, but representative of the church before the throne of God, I'm thinking that this might be it. I could be wrong, but I'm thinking this could be it. This is, friends, this is the true nature of worship is all the holiness of God and, and the awe um, of recognizing him and looking at him, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and um, uh, pure and holy and bright and shining and falling down and worshiping him. So that's what true worship looks like. It's not self-centered. It's not man-centered. So I'm going to end this here because this is where I ended in the original recording when I was doing this in a live Bible study um, before having to correct this the audio in this. This is a recap of what we covered, and then there was a lot of questions and answers. There were many Questions early on about Gog and Magog, um, go to the YouTube channel for that too. There's a, an old Bible study, but although the Bible study is old, the text is even older still, and uh, it's timeless, right? So we're looking at Ezekiel and Gog and Magog in that old Bible study. There'll be time to get into some of that here, but questions were coming up about that, especially in, in light of what the world looks like today, and particularly as we make this recording and Russia is positioning. Russia has moved armies and equipment across um, 6,000 miles of wasteland, all to end up uh, in uh, Ukraine. And the stage is being set. There's nothing directly prophetic about that, but the stage is being set up to where things are in the right position behind the curtain before it's curtain time and they open up and the real play begins um all the furniture has to be set in place uh, all the actors uh you know the the director is is shouting for places everyone take your places and that's one of the things that's happening gog magog meshach tabul all these different countries israel um, they're all in place and ready to go uh as the very last events of world history are unraveling before our eyes so with that, I'm going to close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to look into your word and for making so clear to us what your scriptures say um, regarding the end. If we would just open our eyes and look at it and look beyond just the surface, but to dig in. And thank you, Lord, that you promised to um, make some of these mysteries more and more clear to us as the end comes and uh, as we pursue you, as we look at you. And uh, we lay aside our own self-imposed paradigms or things that we bring in from old preachers from the past and old uh, Sunday school lessons that might be wrong, but just really for ourselves, look into your word and be the Berean as you command us to do. Help us to walk holy lives, Lord, and to worship you in holiness. For it's in your name we pray and we give you thanks, Lord. Amen. I also would quickly add that uh, this material is in this book as well. This is a hardbound version, about 450 pages that are about the last day's wars. Um, it mentions a lot about the, the wedding traditions, the Hebrew wedding traditions, the feast days, and how they inform how we're supposed to look at the scriptures. And um, the uh, synopsis of the book of Revelation, much of this material is in here. The Olivet Discourse, a lot of the material is in here. Uh, there are many, although I picked the wrong page, there are many uh, colorful 
there we go, colorful graphics and so forth in here. Um, so I've worked to keep it as cheap as possible. It's just about at, at cost. There's some uh, printing expenses that you're paying for and you're paying for taxes and you're paying for shipping. And uh, that's about it. I think I might get about a buck, whether it's for this or the digital version. There's a digital version out there. And of course, Amazon's going to have their piece of the pie. And um, what other, whatever other online bookstores that are carrying it, they all want their pound of flesh, of course. And uh, paperbacks, it's available as a paperback version as well. Prophecy from now on. So this covers things from now, not all the old prophecies. That'd be even thicker than that. That's all the things we're looking for that concern and impact uh, today and out all the way up to up to eternity future, not including eternity future. Sorry. I haven't seen, it hasn't heard, it hasn't even entered into my imagination what God has prepared, what he has in store for those his children who love him. So uh, take a look, check it out, different varieties out there, and be blessed. Thanks.